Primary Playlist. I'm your host, Emily Tish Sussman. And this podcast is your primer to the 2020 presidential election, taught to us by the women who know the issues the best. So we're recording this podcast live from the Eaton House in DC, and we're hosting two experts to talk about family-friendly workplace policies, both in government, like the candidates are proposing, but also in business and how business can lead the way. So outdated policies in the workplace disproportionately affect women, but not only women. The US ranks 28th among 36 among developed countries when it comes to employment among women of ages 25 to 54. The workplace policies affect decisions that women make when they start a family and what careers they choose. The managing the director of the IMF said that if there were equal participation of women in the labor market, the GDP would be up by 5%. Economists note that American businesses lose an estimated $12.7 billion annually just because of their employees' child care challenges. And that doesn't even add in the cost of a woman being presentable at work. So with the government dragging their feet on many of these policies, from paid leave to child care, some companies have taken the lead to do it better. So to learn more, I'm joined by Jennifer Hyman, an expert on shaking up the workplace, and Fatima Goss Graves, an expert on shaking up policy to improve the lives of women. So Jen Hyman is the founder and CEO of Rent the Runway, a fashion company disrupting the way that women get dressed. To date, the company has accumulated $525 million in capital, growing the business to over 11 million members and a valuation of $1 billion. Hyman is included on every list from the Times 100 Most Influential People in the World to Forbes' 12 Most Disruptive Names in Business, Fortune's Most Powerful Female Entrepreneurs, Trailblazers, and 40 Under 40. Welcome, Jen. And Fatima Gosgraves is president and CEO of the National Women's Law Center, where she's assumed multiple roles over the past decade. In dedicating her life to fight for more opportunities for women, she has been a catalyst for some of National Women's Law Center's most important initiatives, including the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, which she co-founded. Fatima has been an exceptional advocate for women's rights and is an expert in topics spanning from income security to workplace justice to education access and reproductive rights. Welcome, Fatima. I'm really happy to be here. So Jen, I want to start with you. You wrote an op-ed in the New York Times that many of us read. So you wrote about including paternal leave, sick leave, sabbatical packages, and you really underlined how it was for all the employees of Rent the Runway, not just the salaried ones. So why was this piece so important? Well, I think that as business leaders, we all have a responsibility to be moral leaders and think about more than just the bottom line and think about the impact we're having on our employees' lives and on the communities that we operate in. And for many years of Rent the Runway, as a co-founder of a business with relatively little business experience before starting the company, when I started Rent the Runway, I basically just copied what best-in-class companies do. And what, I, what best in class companies do is they have one set of policies and set of benefits for their corporate salaried employees. So those that tend to be college educated, those that tend to come from wealthier backgrounds in the first place, those people are some, you know, getting parental leave and bereavement leave and paid family sick leave, especially at progressive companies. And their hourly employees tend to get nothing and kind of the bare minimum. And you know, when I started thinking about this, I realized that we were putting our um, folks who actually need the most flexibility because they don't have other income to support themselves in the most perilous position. And so beyond just the moral rationale behind why are you going to give equal benefits to your hourly workers, from a pure financial standpoint, the biggest costs that I have as a business owner are in recruiting and training new employees, especially my hourly workforce. So the idea that someone was going to have a child, their family member was going to get sick, and they were going to immediately quit their job 
as opposed to just having a benefit where they can continue to understand that they had security through Rent the Runway and that they can continue after they cared for their mother who was sick, they could come back to work and continue being a Rent the Runway employee. Um, you know, the last thing I thought about is we already distinguish between employees' relative benefit to a company. It's called compensation. My compensation is much higher than my hourly employee's compensation. But my humanity is not more important. Therefore, my having a child is not more important than any woman or man at my company that chooses to have a child. My mother being sick is not more important than anyone's mother being sick. But why are we doing that where we're effectively saying that those that basically have the least not only are receiving the least flexibility, but we're effectively devaluing the importance of their life. And I just didn't want to be a leader anymore that played any part in that. I mean, I, I, think we're <laughs> I mean, we honestly, we don't hear a lot of CEOs talking like you. What was the feedback you got from other CEOs? You run a massive company. What, did they, what were they saying to you? Well, some CEOs actually followed suit and started implementing this as well and started thinking about, you know, it's not just about the cost of benefits. It's about what losses are there in productivity, in training costs, in hiring costs, in attrition when you don't have these policies in place. I think that people haven't measured that appropriately. So we've also put the numbers behind this at Rent the Runway to actually measure, like, once we implemented these policies in our warehouse, how did that affect our loyalty rates? And how does that, in turn, affect our bottom line? So even if you were doing this purely on the basis of financials, this makes sense to do. So I heard from progressive companies, this makes sense. Um, a lot of startup founders in New York and Silicon Valley were super interested in what we were doing. But unfortunately, I don't think that this made its way to you know, the Fortune 100 yet. And I do think that um, younger business leaders, more pro progressive business leaders, are just going to have to walk the walk and showcase their financials to larger businesses as we all go public and prove out that this is actually something that's both morally viable and financially viable. So Fatima, I want to bring you into this conversation. While Jen is walking the walk and proving to companies that it is both financial and moral, what's the right balance here? I mean, we are in Washington. We make federal policy. What is the right balance here between, between businesses on kind of a go-it-alone strategy and and legislating on it and making federal policy. Right. I mean, you need both. I mean, Jen's leadership is so important because you're able to show not only that uh, it's a financially smart decision, but also that it is possible to do. That's one of the things that policymakers ask all the time, and they want to see some proof points of it. But in truth, it, it shouldn't matter where you work for your ability to be able to have something as fundamental and core as paid leave. The majority of women in this country both are engaging in caregiving and work, right? So we are not in a situation where people are just doing one or the other. And that transition to parenthood, especially for low-income people, is one of those moments that could actually send someone on the brink of deep poverty if they don't have the ability to be able to return to work, if they aren't able to care um, uh, for their child. So there's all sorts of health reasons, there's family reasons, there's anti-poverty reasons, but also showing the business reasons. So you know there is a national solution out there. Right? The Family Act is out there. And um, right now, it's not getting the shine, light, the shine that it really needs. But if we look back over the last decade, what's been inspiring is the states that haven't waited for Congress to get its act together and do this thing. Um, I think the Family Act is one of those things that absolutely can and should and must get done. But you're going to need pressure from a lot of different places, including from companies um, many of the companies we hear say, okay, I'm going to do this, 
But wouldn't it be better if they had some support in doing what's right, not only for them, but for their many workers? I think that people tend to respond to anecdotes and stories. And what you realize when you implement these policies is people start coming out of the woodworks and telling you about the impossible choices that they would have had to make in a situation where they didn't have access to this leave. So for instance, I was just speaking to a seamstress who works in one of my warehouses who just took advantage of my um, bereavement leave. Her mother just passed away and she was able to go back to Venezuela where she's from to grieve for her mother. And she told me that she would have quit her job because there are things in our lives that are more important than work, right? One of your family members passes away, someone has a child, those things fundamentally, like sometimes even if you're in a financially risky situation, sometimes you're still gonna make the choice to grieve for your parent of, because emotionally you need to do that. The other thing is that when people are in situations where they're taking paid family sick leave or bereavement leave, they often need time to actually emotionally heal and grieve. If they were to come into the office that day, I'd be losing massive amounts of productivity. And we all work as a team. So we have to think about the fact that we're caring for people's emotional health and their physical health in order to get the best outcomes for our businesses. I mean, in some ways, it's, it, it, the way that you're presenting it is so helpful because you see that it's really a matter of the ability to work with dignity, mm -hmm. right? Your ability to care for your family in a time of serious need, that, that's actually about the dignity of our workers. And um, right now, we're having a really remarkable public conversation that is about dignity at work and what that means. And I actually think for policymakers, there is a tremendous opportunity to connect the dots, to connect the dots with, uh, with the need to have things like paid family medical leave, paid sick days, to have schedules that are fair, um, to connect the dots with all of those workplace types of protections and labor standards with things like childcare and early learning, right? Because those are the sorts of things that make it possible for people to do what they're doing, which is working and engaging in care. And you've just helped us a little bit, but can you help us just to be specific about what are the specific areas of policies that are being pushed right now? Like, What are the bills that are out there that can actually help People have dignity at work. Right, and so much of this has been thought through. I mean, I'll start with what you need outside of work, right? That's why I mentioned childcare and early learning. And really, there's some exciting proposals out there. Senator Murray has one, Senator Warren has one that really look at um, how do we get to actual universal childcare? How do we get to the point where it is actually affordable and accessible in quality? And that that's a reality for people. Right now, most people, even the low-income people who qualify for child care subsidies, the wait lists are so long they can't even get it, let alone everyone else who's sort of struggling to figure this out. Is in many, many states, it is the most expensive, um, the largest expense that families have, right? That's outrageous. So if you think about that and you pair it with what do people need at work, right? Well, they need a, a basic wage that's at a, a high enough. And the fact that Congress and the House has passed the Raise the Wage Act at a $15 minimum wage, including, by the way, one fair wage for tipped workers was sort of revolutionary. I mean, I really, I hope, will give a boost to the policies that are happening, the policy work that's happening in the state. But we also need things like equal pay. How exciting was it that when the US soccer team won for this country, the crowd shouted and chanted equal pay? I mean, as someone who's been doing this work for a really long time, I never thought that something like that would happen, that like what kind of seen sometimes like wonky policy will be a crowd mandate for really the dignity of work. They are working. They deserve to be paid equally, as do people around this country. There are also a range of issues around people who are pregnant and transitioning into parenthood, having things like pregnancy accommodations. There's a bill called the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. Versions of it have passed around this country in states that basically say if somebody is pregnant and needs an accommodation, they should get one. 
So I shouldn't have to have a job where I'm pregnant and can't have a water bottle if I need it, can't go to the bathroom if I need it, can't get a stool if I'm standing all day. Those people shouldn't have to choose between having a healthy pregnancy and work. Right, so we have really disrupted this conversation. And the last thing that I want to um, raise, because we've talked a lot about paid leave, but listen, it's been almost two years next month since Me Too went viral. And there has been this exciting upending of um, how it is we in this country think about harassment and violence. And it's happened culturally through public conversations, and that's been really important. But there is now a policy that actually names that no matter where you work, no matter what your work classification, you deserve to work with safety. And so domestic workers would be covered. Independent contractors would be covered. People who are working on farms, who are sometimes in farms that are so small or in restaurants and, and stores that are so small that they aren't usually covered under our federal laws. Most of us thought, I think, coming up, that everyone would be covered. That our ban against sex discrimination, which has long included sexual harassment, actually meant that you didn't get to be harassed at every workplace. It turned out for many people that that was actually not true. So there's a bill that has been introduced and is moving with more and more co-sponsors every day called the Be Heard uh, Act. So what I'm excited about right now is not only the corporate engagement, which I think I'm seeing more and more leaders out there who are willing to sort of take a step out there and actually live your values through your company, and that's been tremendous, but actually also setting up policies that the federal government can move on that would mean that no matter where you work, no matter what your zip code, these sort of dignity, workplace dignity issues were also a reality for you. I, I think that the word dignity, while I totally believe in that, and everything that I do is about workplace dignity, I think it moves us into a conversation that's fundamentally just about morality, which I think in, our, in this country, in this political climate, may be slightly dangerous. The reality is not having these policies perpetuate massive income inequality in this country, and we have to feel we, we have to make a decision as to whether we're comfortable with that or not. Personally, I'm not. I believe that people who are salaried employees, who by the way, most people who are salaried employees, who have high incomes, who have gone to four-year colleges, were born into wealthier situations. It's not like I'm smarter than the average hourly worker who works at Rent the Runway. It's that my life circumstances have led me to be able to actually have a career where I would be a salaried employee. And then because I'm a salaried employee, even if my company didn't have these benefits, I could pay for them on my own if I really needed to. When it comes to hourly workers, who for the most part are lower wage earners and disproportionately in communities of color, you basically have a situation where you are perpetuating these impossible choices that someone needs to make, that you're giving the people who because of the nature of their low wages already have complete lack of flexibility in their lives, you're making them basically suffer even more and for the, you see these massive rates of attrition. If you look at um, warehouses around the country, warehouses have huge attrition across all industries. Why do we think that is? Do we think people just quit their jobs? It's like, no, like life happens. And there aren't the workplace policies to care for it. And people have to leave. And therefore, they don't have the wages or the income to provide for their families. What kind of you know, impact? does that have financially on our country? So I just think that no one's really tr been transparent about the analysis around what is happening due to the lack of these policies and how does this affect you know, all of these other categories of how our government is spending money. I mean, I think it's great to bring, I really appreciate you bringing the business perspective into the conversation. Yes, it is a moral imperative. There's also good business reasons 
for all of these policies. I mean, you know, given what Fatima just ran through of the different policy categories that are out there and bills, you know, what do you think would really be a partner for you? And you know, there are a lot of people who want to be the next president. Do you see any of them talking about this in a way that you that you look at it and you say, yeah, that would be the right federal partnership for me to have the right environment and be able to push through the, biz the pro business policies that you want to? So one of the things that I think is a looming crisis that we talk about in a in an overarching way that actually makes it basically the student debt crisis. I think that what we're hearing in these campaigns, especially from the Democratic candidates and the progressive candidates, is let's just make college free, let's erase all debt. I think that there are smart things that we can do to make companies a partner in helping to pay off student debt. So for instance, right now, I can tax free pay for my employees continued education. So if you come to Rent the Runway and you're not a software engineer, I could actually have tax free credits for you every single year to help you become a software engineer. However, what I can't do is I can't use pre-tax dollars to help pay off your student loans. And what that and if I actually do pay off your student loans, which I've done for some of my employees in the past, it is taxed to them as a gift. So they have to pay a 50% tax on my helping to pay off their student loans, which is burdensome, which what ends up happening is the talent pool that I can recruit are often people who have less student loans. So first of all, you know, we would open ourselves up as companies to a more diverse set of talent if we had the tools to actually be able to be part of the solution in the student debt crisis. The second thing related to education is that there is a, a massive mismatch now between the skill sets that I need to hire and what we're ad actually educating people to do. And this is happening both at the hourly uh, amongst hourly employees, also amongst salaried employees. So 11% of chief executives in this country believe that the education system sets people up for their workplace of today, let alone what it's gonna be 20 years from now. And 98% of college administrators think that they're educating people appropriately for the future. <laughs> so let me provide an example of what Rent the Runway just had to do. We need a lot more data scientists and a lot more software engineers. We, of course, hire as many as we possibly can in New York, but there's not enough supply. We had to open up a technology office in Ireland, and not only did we open up this technology office, the reason why we chose Ireland is the government of Ireland introduced us to professors at various universities to un the university system in general, and we were able to educate those professors and say, hey, these are the types of data science skill sets that we need. Here are the types of engineering skill sets that we need. So basically, the government has helped to create a pathway to employment for their university graduates into companies. And that's why so many US companies have actually opened up offices in Ireland. We have a talent crisis right now at Rent the Runway at our, in, in Texas, at our Dallas facility. We're offering a substantial wage to folks in Dallas who are able to be seamstresses, who are able to do dry cleaning, who are able to do spotting, things that one can learn at a trade school. There's actually not knowledge that the government has that if they just had some courses at a, tra at a trade school, I don't need you to have a college degree, that there's actually a pathway to have a middle class life. That hundreds of families, if not, you know, today and thousands of families in the future can have. So we need more communication between businesses and government as to, and, and academic institutions, as to what are the skills that we actually have jobs for today? What are the jobs that we probably will have five to 10 years from now? And how do we change basically educational facilities 
to educate for those. And some of those are not about two-year schools or even four-year schools. Some of them are putting some honor and dignity back to going to a trade program, upskilling yourself for a specific path that exists in your community. Now, I'm not sure that we really hear candidates talking like that yeah, or I hearing this perspective. Thing <laughs> yeah. About any of the things that you just talked about, which I'm, I'm fascinated by and would feel like I want to sit down and have another hour conversation on each of these topics. Um, and I also haven't heard many questions at all about any of the policies I ran through before. You mean in the presidential in conversation? In the presidential conversation. I mean, it, it actually is really disturbing because I had hoped, because there were so many candidates and so many nights of debates, you know, the first two debates, it was two nights each, so you have hours, oh. that there would be more opportunity to center issues that were really core to women's lives. That we would see, actually, for the first time, rich and lengthy conversations about what it will take to actually raise wages to address the challenge of both caring and engaging in work when we have outdated systems. I think I all a that. Democratic candidate needs to say, these are just real stats. 56% of all four-year graduates of colleges are women, meaning the smartest people entering our workforce are women. Women, biologically, are having kids. They're the only ones that can. Men can't, and I don't know if that's going to be invented. So women have to have kids. Women in cities are having kids now, for the most part, after the age of 30. Educated women who have gone to four-year colleges, now the age of childbearing is happening in their 30s. So basically, after these women are in the workforce for about 10 years, they have a child, and 30% of those women don't go back to work. It is primarily, when you ask them, because of lack of access to parental leave policies. We're taking our smartest people. We have a, basically a nationwide attrition problem. If we were looking at our government the way that a business looks at attrition, you might have quicker pathways to action. Our highest talent, our highest caliber talent is leaving. It's like, what do we do about that? And not only it's our highest caliber talent, it's our majority talent. It's 56% of college graduates. Every single year, more and more women are graduating. There's actually a problem that we have in this country amongst lower rates of education amongst men. But women are the ones who are increasingly getting the college degrees and the graduate degrees. So they're the, our most sophisticated workers. And they're the ones dropping out because they don't have access to these leave policies. And they don't have access to other child care policies and paid family sick leave because even though women are the most sophisticated workers at this point in time, they're still doing 85% of childcare at home and over 90% of all household items. So unless we have, th this is really, we need the policies in the first place because that's the only thing that government can really help us with. But we also need to have a cultural conversation okay. about kind of equality in, in the family and what does masculinity mean in 2019. And actually, and this is why it's so disturbing that we haven't yet seen rich public debate uh, so far over the course of three primaries. Because that, in part, is tied to the cultural conversation. The conversation that we have throughout 2020, no matter the candidates, is really about what matters in this country. What are our priorities? In what direction will we be heading? And so the fact that what we have seen around these core fundamental questions around women and work have been so ancillary is really, really disturbing. And you know, uh, when Senator Kirsten Gillibrand was on the stage, she used to sort of bring it up Mm -hmm. um, voluntarily, um, <laughs> and, you know, connecting the dots. You know, I'm going to connect that issue over here to, and bring it back because I really want to make sure I'm talking about women. She shouldn't have had to do that, frankly. There should have been square co questions coming from the moderators. And so we haven't seen it yet. It's early-ish. But I do want to follow up on this. I mean, as you point out, it's not for lack of trying. I mean, Senator Gillibrand really did center right, and these would, issues. And then they would change the topic. And then they would change the topic. But she also was among the first, I mean, not the first wave, but you know, the earlier wave of candidates to drop out. 
So, you know, what do you think that says about us as an electorate? And what do you think that says about the conversation moving forward? If she's not in it, do you think these issues will ever be at the forefront? Well, I think it's up to all of us to continue to, pet, to press the various gatekeepers who sort of help shape what we hear and think about in public debate to do more, right? So I don't think we should just settle for business as usual. If you look over the history of debates, um, Time's Up did this really an important analysis where they showed that out of like thousands of debate questions over the course of decades, there were like less than 10 <laughs> that actually addressed women's issues. So it is, it, we are asking for a shift, right? We're asking for them to change the way that they have handled this. And actually, in my mind, to meet the cultural moment that we found ourselves in. It cannot be that two years ago, millions of women marched around the world and that you've seen Me Too go viral and you've seen a historic number of women now serving in Congress and yet it isn't one of the core and central conversations that we're having in our presidential. And so from, you know, this spring, there uh, was this spate of really dangerous and scary bans on abortion that were sweeping. Mm -hmm. That is the sort of thing where on a Tuesday, people rallied in the streets. Yeah. It is hard to get people to rally on a Tuesday. If you guys have not tried that, that is not an easy thing to do. And they did because they were so disturbed. Yet, again, we're not having the giant rich conversation. It's early-ish. It is time for gatekeepers to do something different. The debate moderators, you know, the next debate is going to be in Ohio. It comes right around the time when Me Too went viral. I cannot believe that they can have a debate that does not address these issues squarely. I will be upset if they don't. You will be well, hearing from us, but of, I, I, we need it. Part of the role, I think, of the media and the moderators of the debate would be to kind of help us as citizens reframe how we think about the issue in the first place. So yeah. for instance, one way that has completely reframed the way that I think about student debt is understanding who is the average college student today in the United States. So just a fun fact for you all, 25% of college students today have children, are women with, are women with children. Um, the majority of college students today are actually at two-year community colleges, and 40% of those people don't graduate but still leave with debt. You know, I think that sometimes we have assumptions on who we're even talking about. You know, in the past, when I heard about student debt, I thought about it myself, right? I thought about, you know, some student who goes to Harvard or who goes to business school and they end up in, you know, they have student debt. And, you know, that changes then. If I'm thinking about the context of, you know, if I'm thinking about the data differently, I'm going to come up with different solutions. Yeah. So if I now know that for the most part when we say student debt, we're talking about community college and we're talking about women and we're talking about women with children, it actually leads to different kinds of solutions that put, connect back yeah. to the other policies that yeah. we were talking about. So, you know, the media can do a good job saying, you know what, student debt is actually connected to things like parental leave. That's right. Um, because a lot of the folks that are at community colleges are employed. You know, a huge percentage of the college population is doing college at night or online while employed in a full-time job. And the media can frame the conversation for us, but when it comes to leadership about actually taking action, something that you've said before is that you think that it really requires having women in the C-suite, at yeah. the CEO table, to be in those conversations to help us reframe and bring the lived experience as the experts on the issue. Do you think that's true on the political stage as well? Like, I mean, every presidential candidate, almost every presidential candidate supports universal leave policies, but do you think that it can really only truly be implemented if we have a female president? I think that having a candidate slate my goal is to have a candidate slate that actually looks like the true demographics of the country. So that is related to women, that's related to you know, 
someone's racial background, their ethnicity, their sexuality, like those are the only ways that we're gonna talk about the real issues that impact everyone. And I think for too long in both parties, we've had a slew of candidates, and candidates are leaders, who represent a very small segment of the population. And so I often talk about in entrepreneurship, so very little capital tends to go to women um, in the fields of entrepreneurship. So less than 2% of dollars go to women. Well, what that does is it means that we're not funding a diversity of ideas. Entrepreneurs are the biggest job creators in this country. And I can only, the entrepreneur or the founder essentially is coming up with an idea based on their lived experience. Rent the Runway wouldn't exist if not founded by two women, if not led by women. This is not a problem that men have. Now, I've been honest about the fact that I grew up in a comfortable financial background. I had every privilege given to me. Um, I did not, and so therefore the kinds of problems that I see in the world are based on my experience. There's a problem in entrepreneurship in that a lot, most of the capital comes to people from upper middle class or wealthier backgrounds in the first place. So those entrepreneurs are not solving the problems of folks that grew up in rural communities, in folks that grew up in impoverished communities, because I can't solve a problem that I don't understand. So at least I have the humility to say that. I cannot solve a problem that I don't fully understand, that I haven't lived myself. I, can, I need to educate myself on that, but I think that we need leaders to actually come from all of these backgrounds, to have lived these life situations so they could be leaders and candidates. It's the same thing. So that they could actually speak from a place of true knowledge and true authenticity. So yes, I think we do need women to actually be in positions of power to change the game. I think we need, you know, we've seen like some of the most massive uh, social changes of our lifetime happen under the Obama administration. Why do we think that that is? You know, it's very clear like that Obama's background, Michelle's background lent itself to them thinking about a slate of issues that might not have been considered in previous or in previous administrations. That is important. People's personal experience um, affects their passion level. Right? Fundamentally, we only spend our time on things we're passionate about, whether you're in politics or you're in business. And so you need people who are passionate about the issues to make those changes. You mentioned both sides and leadership, and even today there is um, an Ivanka Trump appearance um, about children. And you know, she started, she went into the Trump campaign talking about women who work and, and had a book come out about it. I think with that title. Do you, did it help move anything forward? So I'm gonna start with the good, but then I can't end with the good. Um, it, was, it was really important in 2016 that for the first time we saw both parties raising childcare as important issues in the presidential campaign. I think that public conversation gave it the boost that it needed and the year, a year later, Congress invested in childcare in historic rates. So you can draw a direct line to the public conversation that happened then, and the fact that both parties had it was really important. Here's the, the reason I want a detailed conversation about the suite of issues we've been talking about, because it's very easy and it's actually become more popular, in fact, um, across parties to say, I support equal pay, I support paid leave, I support childcare. Is that popular in both parties? It is popular in okay. both parties, especially equal pay, right? Here's why. People, nobody wants to be paid unfairly, right? Everybody wants fair pay for themselves and for the people around them. It is more popular than you would think. This is a winning thing to do. The question is, what are you going to do about it? And so at the highest level, it's very possible everyone agrees on a lot of things. But when you get down to the details, 
and there may be fundamental disagreement, we have a problem. So, you know, in, you know, Ivanka Trump talked about equal pay in the 2016 election. She would list it as important. And then the Trump administration, one of the first things it did in its first year was stop the equal pay data collection tool. And you know, we uh, at the National Women's Law Center were able to file a lawsuit and get that restored, and now they're trying to stop it again. And I will just say that it's one thing to be for something symbolically, and a very different thing to put the policies in place when you have the ability to do so. So that's why I say I'm going to say the good and the bad. I'm all for the cultural message and the cultural conversation, but who's ever in these seats of power and has the opportunity to actually make a difference in people's lives has to carry that burden of implementing the high level idea in a way that matters to people. I think that as citizens, we may have more power to change the way businesses operate than change how government operates more quickly. And that's actually important. So I, if you look at what the CEO of Walmart just did related to guns, Walmart has more jurisdiction, more power, more engagement with American citizens on a daily basis than certainly any state, but I think than, than almost, than the federal government. I mean, hundreds of millions of people are walking into a Walmart several times a week. When they make a decision that is related to policy, it actually affects people's lives immediately. Now, how do we decide as citizens then which companies we should be pressuring? Because when he makes that change as the CEO of Walmart, as one of the biggest companies in the country, it gives other CEOs permission to do the same, who also are CEOs of other large organizations. So can we target the right companies of influence by nature of being their customers and saying, you know what, you need to make this change? And there have been various movements that have started, I mean, to try to get companies to change their policies. Mm -hmm. And the tactic would be get the company to change its policy because it has tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of customers. It's going to affect how we live. And that's going to impact the government because companies are donating to political candidates. So I think that you know, we saw Walmart change its policies really, really quickly after the you know, deadly shooting in one of their stores in Texas. So I'm very encouraged by what we could all do if we focus on the right Fortune 100 companies and we make it um, really impactful for them to not listen to us. So I want to ask this question of both of you. Given that, that family-friendly policies and the importance and the pro-business arguments have really been missing from the presidential conversations so far, and we're almost about a year out from people voting, Going into it the day of and the day after, people like me who basically know nothing will go on TV and give hot takes about like, what was the mandate. And we'll look at exit polls, but we'll look at everything in the environment around it. So how do we make sure that these issues are the mandate? I want to ask both of you that question. So I don't think that it's going to happen by accident. I actually think part of the work that we have to do now is demand again and again that these questions be asked and that candidates talk about them more. So that is, that is the first point. The second thing is I, I actually think that point around the hot takes and the mandates, I mean, I, I always watch that stuff too and I think we have very little information right now. How do we know what people cared about when they um, pressed that button, pulled that uh, lever? And um, so one of the things that I think is gonna be really important is throughout the course of the next year to do you know, movement-led conversations that are reminding not just candidates, but public and influencers, what it is people are saying is important to them. 
we had an opportunity to do one of those types of conversations in Michigan around the debates in Detroit with an organization called Mothering Justice where people were having sort of a very different conversation, frankly, than was happening inside the Fox Theater. And you could hear what it is that people cared about. I think spotlighting that will help hold the feet to the fire so that when people come out of an election and have their take, that doesn't match the reality of anyone I know. I'm able to point to the conversations that I know have happened throughout the course of the year. So I think pressure on the gatekeepers, but making more visible the actual stories of real people who are saying what matters to them right now. Great. How do you think we keep up the pressure? I think that as an electorate, we're going to have to show that we vote based on substance and not style and that we're willing to understand that issues are nuanced and not everything could be summed up in a 10 second or 30 second soundbite or a hot take. I think that these issues all relate to each other, they're complicated, and they're, we're not giving candidates time or the platform to, or we really don't require them to even go into detail about how any of their plans are going to be implemented and if they have any sort of basis in reality. And I consider myself to be a fairly you know, educated person. I was just on maternity leave and spent four months reading the news and listening to the news for a long period of time while I was nursing and, you know, preoccupied with my infant and which by the way sounds like a very realistic version of maternity leave seriously yeah. I mean that is like you know with the infant half a brain but watching the news like sounds very yeah. realistic actually and you would think that I would know and truly understand at this point what these policies what these candidates are offering up and while I can come up with the buzzwords that they're offering up like, I am the person who is going to go deep if there's an article or if there's something substantive, and it's just not there. How do I find out, you know, what you mean beyond just the headline? And that's where I think that we could be asking more questions as citizens, and we can be showing based on our vote that someone who might not have all the flash, but potentially has the smarts and the substance, can cut through and make an impact with us. It's hard to do that in 30 second sound bites. It's super hard to do that also on social media. I'm not sure that the way that we get information today will ever um, complement what I just said. Like as we move to a world where social media occupies the majority of how we engage in the world and how we receive information, I'm not sure we'll ever be able to get back to these issues of, of substance and context and nuance, but I hope so. And I hope someone in the social media world kind of pushes that and invents that. And we all put pressure on you know, the Facebooks and the Twitters of the world to make changes to their own websites. I mean, the word limit on Twitter affects more about national policy than basically <laughs> any other product feature around. <laughs> it's terrifying. <laughs> so things that are, you know, as simple as that, like I don't see a, pro a national protest beyond the word limit on Twitter, but that's how we receive our political messaging, our news, our context, like it's happening on that platform. So, so the CEO of that platform needs to stand up and take some responsibility. You know, Facebook is basically the, Mark Zuckerberg is in a sense, the president of the world in terms of the audience and how much we engage in all of his platforms. Well, take some responsibility and actually realize that with that power comes a massive, massive amount of moral responsibility that you have not only to the US, but globally. So we took some questions from the audience. Um, the first question that we have is to you, unless you also just had a child I don't know about. My, my kids are older. Okay, that's what I thought. All right, <laughs> so we have a question here for you, Jen. So given that you just came back from maternity leave, what new perspectives do you think that you have in fighting for and the need for paid leave? And even though it's been a little while, let's also ask you, Fatima. Okay. 
I've taken two maternity leaves over the past two years. Number one, I can tell you that it's essential medically and physically. You know, one in every four American women goes back to work within 10 days of having a child. We're basically putting those women at medical risk to do that. And for the most part, those are women who already are in fi financially uh, difficult situations. I would say that my company, I'm the CEO, and I will also say my company didn't suffer by having me on <laughs> parental leave. And I think that too, there's too much arrogance to think that one individual being out for a period of time will actually affect the business. If you've hired a great team around you, you can be out for a period of time and your business will be fantastic. And so I'm not sure what the counter argument is to actually not enabling women and men to take parental leave. Because if I could do it and I'm the CEO and my company is in better shape today than it was four months ago when I left for leave, then either I'm ineffective and unneeded, which I don't think is true, <laughs> or people can take parental leave and have a healthy life while also having a healthy relationship with their job. Well, so I totally agree with you. It's definitely critical for emotional and physical health. And my kids are now 11 and 7, and so it, it feels far away. Um, but here's one thing that always will stick with me, with, especially with my second child. My, at the time, my husband worked for the federal government and had no paid leave. And so, you know, he, he took some unpaid leave, he, you know, he, and was um, home. But it makes a difference for every parent to be able to take that leave, both for the care and recovery that you have after you have a child, but also for those early days when you were bonding and learning together. And, um, and so one of the things that I think is so important is that these policies be gender neutral, that they apply equally, and that we think about them as um, family leave and medical leave for self-care all together. And so you, know, you never want people to have to miss out on, on those time, and you can't get that time back. 7-Eleven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, this has been a fascinating conversation. Sadly for me, we've come to the end of it. But thank you so much, Fatima and for Jen, for lending your time and expertise. Thank you, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I also just want to acknowledge the staff of Brent the Runway, Wonder Media Network, Eaton House, and Hayes Initiative, who made this all come together and did an incredible job. So just for you guys, if you want to subscribe and rate this episode of Primary Playlist, it will be on Apple Podcasts. Uh, you can tag Rent the Runway, National Men's Law Center, and Primary Playlist on Twitter. And then it'll, be put, it'll all be emailed out to you next week, and hopefully you'll share it with friends and recommend it. So thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>